Hey everyone, Noah Zerbe here. This is one in a series of short videos introducing key concepts in international political economy. In this video, we're going to explore the work of the Austro-Hungarian political economist Karl Polanyi, and specifically his idea of market embeddedness. Uh, this concept is central to understanding the post-war compromises of embedded liberalism, which we examine in more detail in another video. So let's go ahead and get started. Polanyi's concept of market embeddedness helps us make sense of broad historical periods in global markets. Polanyi was an Austro-Hungarian economist whose most famous work, The Great Transformation, published in 1944, represented an attempt to analyze and explain the emergence of capitalism in England. Central to Polanyi's analysis was this idea of market society. Put simply, Polanyi contended that prior to the emergence of capitalism, the relationship between the economy and society was one that he described as being embedded or embeddedness. By this he means that the economy was subject to social limitations on its functioning. Social traditions and principles of redistribution or reciprocity, gift giving, and other social limits limited the scope of marketness in society. The role of the market was therefore limited and markets themselves played a relatively limited role in human affairs more broadly. However, for Polanyi, the rise of capitalism depended on the transformation of this relationship, the expansion of the role of market in society, the removal of those traditional social limits on the market, and indeed in some ways the reversal of the relationship between economy and society. Where the economy had historically been grounded in broader social relationships, now broader social relationships were to be grounded in the economy. Specifically, Polanyi contended that central to the emergence of capitalism was the creation of markets in land or nature, labor or people, and money or capital. According to Polanyi, only when market forces determined the price and thus the value of these items by treating them as commodities for sale on the market, a process Polanyi refers to as the commodity fiction, only when that takes place can capitalism emerge. But there's a problem. As Polanyi himself observes, to allow the market mechanism to be the sole director of the fate of human beings and their natural environment, indeed even the amount and use of purchasing power, would result in the demolition of society. Robbed of the protective covering of cultural institutions, human beings would perish from the effects of social exposure. They would die as the victims of acute social dislocation through vice, perversion, crime, and starvation. Nature would be reduced to its elements, neighborhoods and landscapes defiled, rivers polluted, military safety jeopardized, the power to produce food and raw materials destroyed. No society could withstand the effects of such a system of crude fictions, even for the shortest stretch of time, unless its human and natural substance, as well as its business organization, was protected against the ravages of this satanic mill. And so, according to Polanyi, society is in a constant move back and forth, expanding protections against the market and withdrawing those protections over time, and then reintroducing new protections as the impact of Polanyi's satanic mill are realized. Polanyi refers to these back and forth movements as the double movement. Using Polanyi's principle of market embeddedness, and keeping to his observation that society is constantly moving back and forth, disembedding and re-embedding the market by introducing social safety nets and imposing limits, it's possible to observe broad historical swings in the relative degree of market embeddedness over time. Specifically, we can identify six broad historical periods. Before we do, though, it's important to remember that the distinction between embedded and disembedded market centers on the degree to which social limits can be imposed on the functioning of the markets. And while we may be tempted to think of them as two distinct categories, that is, either embedded or disembedded, it's probably better to think of embeddedness as a spectrum onto which markets can be placed and along which they may move over time. And remember that in, by embeddedness, we're looking at the relative degree of social, political, or cultural control over the market. That is, economies which are more embedded in broader social relations are subject to greater social, political, or cultural limits than markets which are relatively disembedded. So with that in mind, as I said, we can identify several broad periods of market embeddedness. First, prior to the 1830s, markets were generally deeply embedded in social relationships. Markets were relatively limited, it limited in their reach, and trade was relatively short in distance. Barter, not monetary exchange, was the dominant form of transaction. According to Polanyi, there were three broad types of economic systems that existed before the 1830s. 
redistributive systems where trade and production focused on a central entity like a tribal leader or a feudal lord and then was redistributed to members of that society. Redistributive systems were common in West Africa prior to colonization. Another example is the potlatch system practiced by Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest. Reciprocity-based systems, where the exchange of goods was governed by complex, if unwritten, reciprocal exchange, sometimes called gift-giving, between social groups. Under such systems, gift-giving was a key form of political power, determining leadership and creating social obligation between groups. Many anthropologists contend that such systems were actually commonplace in the Global South prior to colonization. Examples include the Kula exchange system in Papua New Guinea and the system used in the, by the San of South Africa. And finally, householding systems, where production was centered on the individual household and family units were largely self-sufficient, producing their own food, textiles, and tools for their own use and consumption. Such systems were common in Europe following the collapse of the Roman Empire and can also be seen in China during the Ming dynasties and the Incan Empire, for example. Regardless of the differences between these systems, Polanyi notes that they share a common organization based on non-market exchange. Rather, they depended on social principles of symmetry, exchange, and autarky, or self-sufficiency of the group. Markets may have existed, but they were viewed as an auxiliary avenue for the exchange of goods not otherwise attainable, rather than as the central organizing principle of society. Further, land and labor were governed by specific social rules and were generally not subject to valuation based on market forces. But beginning in the 1830s, dramatic social reorganization began. In 1834, the British Parliament passed the Poor Laws Amendment Act. The act eliminated traditional systems of welfare and, in particular, food relief for the poor. Instead, workhouses, or sometimes called poorhouses, were established as the only form of charity and social support. The conditions in workhouses were made as miserable as possible to dissuade all those except the truly needy from securing support. Families, men, women, and children, were separated and placed in different workhouses far apart from one another. The labor required of those in workhouses was excruciating, breaking stones, crushing bone to produce fertilizer, or picking fibers using a large metal spike. Many workhouses looked and operated more like prisons than charities. Other examples of this process can also be seen. In 1815, the British Parliament passed the Corn Laws, which imposed restrictions on the import of corn, wheat, and other cereals in Britain in an effort to protect British farmers from competition. In 1846, it repealed those regulations, effectively permitting the price of food to be determined by market forces. Britain also used its massive naval power, remember that this is the period of Pax Britannica, the dominance of the British Empire, it used its naval power to promote free trade internationally. Britain was effectively trying to use its head start in industrialization to its advantage in competition with other European powers, and the colonization of Latin America, Africa, and Asia fit neatly into this model. And in the United States, similar shifts were also taking place. Child labor was common, and there were few restrictions governing wages, working hours, or worker health and safety. This was the era of the robber barons and the monopolies of child labor and industrialization. But for Polanyi, the purpose of the elimination of charity in favor of workhouses and broader shifts towards free trade was clear. By removing charity and other forms of social redistribution and obligation, social reproduction was increasingly subject to market forces. The market, in other words, increasingly became the primary determinant of the value of human life and of the natural world. The economy was increasingly disembedded from society. But remember Polanyi's concept of the double movement. Oppressive working conditions and limited safety nets were sparking popular unrest. Unions were formed to push for higher wages and better working conditions. Remember also that this was the period of Marx and Engels in the writing of the Communist Manifesto, a call for, quote, workers of the world to unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. During the latter part of this period, the pendulum began to swing back slowly towards the embeddedness of the economy into society, as the state gave in to demands for greater social productions. In Germany, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck introduced the first formal state-based welfare system and introduced work workplace safety regulations. In England, some of the elements of the poor laws were repealed, and in the United States, progressive-era regulations resulted in new laws that restricted the power of corporations. 
but it was the Great Depression that really marked the end of this first era of classical liberalism. Faced with a dramatic economic crisis, countries abandoned principles of free trade and imposed strict controls in the forms of tariffs and quotas. To prevent sharp increases in popular unrest, and in response to the massive increase in unemployment, the United States adopted New Deal programs, which dramatically expanded social safety nets, introduced social security, imposed new workplace regulations intended to improve workers' safety, increased wages, reduced working hours, and limited child work. In a sense, World War II continued this trend. The market was subsumed into the war effort, which was total in focus. Production was redirected to a war footing, and consumer demand and more broadly market forces were limited by rationing and price controls. The economy, in other words, was made subservient to the needs of the state to conduct war. There was also a broader sense that the system of unfettered free markets had failed. This was not just an intervention intended to save the free market, but it was a concerted effort to re-embed the market back into broader social relations, to impose new limits on the marketization of society. After the war, it was clear that a return to the laissez-faire economic system of the pre-war period was no longer viable. The protections established for workers had firmly enshrined demand for workplace protections, and the social safety net established by governments around the world had proved popular and served to satisfy popular demands for protections against the worst excesses of Polanyi's satanic mill. At the same time, it was broadly recognized that international trade was beneficial and resulted in greater productive output, as well as a wider variety of consumer goods available at lower prices. The question for governments then was how to balance these competing forces. The compromise that was reached was dubbed embedded liberalism. We examine the exact nature of this compromise in another video, but for now suffice it to say that embedded liberalism sought to establish the principles of free trade at the global level with the domestic protection, strong social safety nets, and broad regulation of the economy at the domestic level. Keynesianism was the economic order of the day, and the state in both Europe and the United States intervened extensively in order to maintain full employment. At the global level, capital controls were imposed to regulate global currency, and the U.S. dollar was made the global reserve currency. In this sense, embedded liberalism represented a middle position between the embedded and disembedded market spectrum ends. By the early 1970s, the Keynesian Compromise and the global system of embedded liberalism began to come under stress and break down. The global oil crisis of 1973 and 79 led to severe market disruptions. The economic disruption led to a global recession beginning in 1974. By the late 1970s, the U.S. economy as well as the other leading economies in the world were all suffering from a crisis of stagflation, high rates of unemployment combined with high rates of inflation. The Keynesian model, which guided economic and fiscal policy through most of the post-war period to this date, had difficulty addressing the combined crisis of stagflation. And meanwhile, proponents of a new economic theory, dubbed monetarism and supply-side economics, were promoting an alternative policy framework, which would come to be called neoliberalism. The era of neoliberal economic policy rooted in monetary policy and supply-side economics was marked symbolically by a number of events. The election of Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in 1979 and the election of Ronald Reagan as President of the United States in 1980 signaled a shift in policy frameworks in both Washington and London. In Latin America, the Washington Consensus and structural adjustment programs liberalized economies and imposed austerity programs, reducing the role of the state and making dramatic cuts to social safety nets across the region. The Berg Consensus and structural adjustment programs in Africa and Asia resulted in similar cuts. This process was accelerated following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The pendulum had clearly swung back in favor of liberalization and disembedding markets in, from social and political limits. But again, the social dislocation and the economic inequality that resulted from the disembedding of the markets provoked a social reaction. Following the 1997 Asian financial crisis, the International Monetary Fund imposed strict conditionalities on countries receiving emergency financial assistance. According to many analysts, this actually served to deepen the crisis in countries like South Korea, Thailand, and Indonesia. The IMF policies, which had been central to structural adjustment programs imposed on economies around the world for nearly 20 years, provoked popular uprising and were subject to widespread academic and policy-based critique. 
While the 1997 Asian financial crisis led to cracks in the facade of neoliberalism, it was not until the 2007-2008 global financial crisis that a shift away from neoliberalism and efforts to re-abed the economy would reach their zenith. The 2007-2008 global financial crisis was, to the time, the most serious financial crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Around the world, global stock markets witnessed sharp declines, and a number of companies were forced to declare bankruptcy. In China, Japan, the European Union, the United States, and elsewhere, governments intervened extensively in an effort to rekindle economic activity and resolve the crisis. They also imposed new restrictions and regulations on the economy in an effort to prevent another crisis from emerging. Ironically, many of the new regulations were efforts to reimpose frameworks that were removed during the era of liberalization that began in the early 1980s. At the global level, a new post-Washington consensus emerged in thinking about development, where the international financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, had been steadfast proponents of liberalization in the 1980s and 1990s, by the early 2000s, they had begun to reverse course and advocate a specific, albeit limited, role for the state in regulating the economy. So where do we go from here? That's an interesting question. Polanyi's work suggests that the pendulum will continue to swing back and forth between embedding and disembedding liberalization and expanded regulation. Such swings will likely continue to be driven by global crises, depressions, recessions, global financial crises, periods of economic stability, uh, perhaps even global pandemics. So this concludes our consideration of Polanyi's idea of market embeddedness. Please leave any questions you have below, and thanks for watching. Goodbye.